Hey everyone, welcome to the Market and Grow show where we talk to growing brands and business owners uh, who are thriving and growing their brands uh, in this challenging economy. With me, I have my friend, Marie Alexander. She is uh, a really awesome entrepreneur. I was going to say badass, but well, there you go. I said it. I was trying to be not polite. She's amazing. And you definitely need to hear the entirety of this show. Number one. Number two is if you ever get a chance to meet her or listen to her talk, you should do that. You should never pass up that option. She has a wealth of knowledge. Uh, so she is out of Miami, Florida, uh, runs an active wear, gender neutral active wear brand. Uh, and it's growing. It's amazing, you know, how much she has grown in the last two years that I've known her, as well as she has 20 plus years in fashion industry. So if you have any question about fashion or anything about getting started in the fashion business, Maria Alexander is a person. With that, welcome, Maria Alexander. It's great. Uh, to have thank you, you Sajin. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. Same here. Same here. I think you know how much I've get, gotten excited to talk to you uh, officially. I mean, I know we've been, you know, chit-chatting and talking a lot of things about business and life. So one thing is for people who do not know you, do you want to share a little bit about you, uh, yourself, uh, your background, so that kind of people can kind of get grounded on where you're coming from and what you are capable of doing? Well, um, I've been an artist my entire life. I started designing clothing when I was around 10 years old, made my first actual wedding dress that walked down an eye when I was 14. So it was very obvious what I was going to do with my life. Uh, I went to SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design, got a BFA in fashion uh, a few years ago. And uh, I've been in fashion for over 20 years, uh, not counting my teenage years when I, that's all I did. I made all, you know, all my friends prom dresses, graduation gowns, I'd made wedding gowns, but officially in the industry, I've been in for about over 20 years. I was a wedding designer, evening wear and wedding designer for a good, over almost 10 years or maybe closer to 15 years. Uh, but I've been very gratefully a business owner not just a fashion designer, but a business owner for all my life. I just didn't recognize it and didn't call myself that until a few years ago. Okay, cool. Well, you know, I think I messed up the interaction and I didn't really tell, talk about your current business, which is Outplay Brands. So can you talk about that? How did it get started and what your role is and things like that? Uh, well, I am the founder and CEO of Outplay, and Outplay is the first direct-to-consumer, gender-neutral, fully gender-neutral uh, swimwear and active wear brand in the United States. Uh, we make, we started with swimwear. Now we've added a lot of swim of sportswear. Sorry, sportswear. So we're we're converting it. We're turning in Outplay into an active wear brand, and it is, uh, it's the best, most fun thing I've ever done and the most gratifying because our customers are amazing. So we, our customer base are, is people who haven't been seen or heard by the traditional garment industry and don't really have or don't fit into the binaries of female clothing or male clothing and just want to feel like they've been seen, heard, and they can feel good in their clothing. Because for me, clothing is very, um, uh, I, I say this a lot. People think that clothing is very materialistic and unnecessary and it's just dumb and frivolous. And it isn't because what we wear is how we present ourselves to the world. So that gives you, it can either give you the confidence to present yourself in an amazing way to others. And it, as it, is, it can also really make you feel uncomfortable, not feel confident in what you're doing by the way you're presenting yourself. So it is incredibly important. And when you don't find brands that really cater to who you are and just want to fit you into a box, that, that, that can affect people's uh, confidence when, when they're facing the rest of the world. So that's what we get to do at Outplay. We get to help people find their confidence and dress who they are and match the inside with the outside so they can present themselves to the world as who they truly are, regardless of gender or size. 
Love it. And folks, uh, trust me, I've been, uh, I guess you could say, spying on Maria Alexander on our Instagram, <laughs> checking out all the awesome reviews that she's been getting from her, you know, fans, customers. So definitely, you know, check, check them out uh, on Instagram and things like that. Okay, coming back. What made you start Outplay? Uh, was there uh, something or is it just like, I want to do it because no one is addressing this market? Oh, no, it was a, a series of pivots. Uh, I was, when I was a bridal designer in another world, in another lifetime, uh, I was, I lived through 2008, the financial disaster in 2008. Uh, something I'm starting to recognize. <laughs> let's not go there. It's let's be possible. Yeah, let's not go there. Um, but, you know, we sold very expensive gowns. So it was really, really tough for us. And we had, you know, stores closed down on us without even paying for the product that we served. And so I was trying to find something. It, the whole situation just made me rethink what I was doing and what I was really, what was I accomplishing? And was I really happy doing with what I was doing? And it, I felt like I, there had to be something I could do with my art because I consider my designing of clothing as art. And I wanted to do something with my art that meant more and that did more for people. And so I started first looking into, because all I did was bridal and that's all I knew. I started looking into the, into same sex marriages. And I looked into what, well, the person who doesn't want to wear a dress, what do they wear? Where do they get it? So that led me down to down a road where uh, I partnered with the first gay wedding planner in the country and she and I uh, basically joined forces because she was a wedding planner and I was a bridal designer. And I came up with this line of clothing that was wedding attire. It was jackets, vests, and pants. It was all separates. First time I had ever sold clothing online. And I designed this whole collection and we put it online. So you can buy the jacket, the vest, and the pants that you wanted, mix and match them as you wanted. So there were pieces that were more traditionally feminine. There were pieces that were more traditionally masculine and there were more androgynous pieces and you can mix and match what you wanted. In the process of building that brand, uh, it took me about three years of really getting the fit correct. Uh, so I, I, I would have focus groups that I would meet with and test the clothing out on and check the measurements, check how it fit, how people moved in it. But I would just put the clothes on them and listen and just sit there and listen. And then usually... These groups get really fun and we would sit down and talk and, you know, have some coffee, some tea, and we'd sit there for another two hours just talking. And I kept hearing these horror stories of the things that people did to their bodies because of body dysphoria, because they just don't feel like the, you know, like their gender wasn't quite right or that the clothing that they were buying didn't really fit who they were. So I started to hear really bad, really horrible stories of the things that people did to their bodies in order to accommodate their bodies to the clothing that they were finding. And I figured, wait, this is just not, it's just not right for people to do this to themselves. There has to be a better way. And that's when I came up with the first designs of our compression tops, our swim compression tops that allow, that was the first, biggest problem I kept seeing was People started to, people were doing, or still do, because people still do this, unfortunately. They really harm their bodies when it comes to uh, chest dysphoria. And so that was the biggest issue that I found through all these conversations. So I came up with the two compression tops. The, our first compression tops was were the swimming, which is our short top, and the flatsy, which is our, our full length top. And I created a product that didn't exist where we have different layers of compression, depending on what you want to do with the top. So if you want to just have support or if you want to flatten your chest as much as possible, we got that for you. And that's where that really came from. So I pivoted where um, the bridal line basically died off. Uh, I, that wasn't what, where I wanted to go. And um our, my business partner and I went separate ways and I started out play. It was, it was a matter of basically I switched one website on uh, off and turn the other one on. And we launched the first two tops with a pre-order. So I didn't even have customers yet. And I had just the, the samples because so samples took me a while to create because I, this is product had never existed before. So uh, we launched with those two tops and with pre-orders paid for the first production of the tops. And it just, it's grown from there. <laughs> Amazing, amazing. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. And in fact, you know, as you were sharing your story, uh, which obviously I'd never asked you prior to this uh, you know, show, and I'm glad I did because 
feels like you know I'm talking to the next Sarah Blakely from Spanx. <laughs> That's a huge compliment, by the way. Thank you. Um, welcome. But I, I felt like that's what that is. What's who you are going to become? You know, fifteen or twenty years from now, maybe ten years from now. Twenty fifteen is too far out. But li- literally, you are just there, oh, wow. listening to that's your customers, listening to the pain points, helping focus group things like that. Stay at it, Marie Alexander. That's that's a huge compliment, <laughs> Sarah Blake. That's a huge compliment. <laughs> you, you know, um, but she didn't start that way, right? If you no, yeah, she she was selling Xerox machines door to door. There you go. And what she did was solve a problem. Yeah, right? and you are also solving a problem because there is a huge market out there, and like you said, most of the uh, companies out there are basically thinking binaries, and there are people in well, between. Now it's catching on. The gender neutral idea is catching on, but the problem is that people are catching on the wrong way. You have very large brands that call slap a label that says gender neutral on something, and they just buy they just put men's jeans in the female department. That's not what not that's not what bi- non binary is, and that's not what gender neutral is. So they're trying. There are several brands that have tried and failed and had to eliminate the the collection, and then they've started over again because they're not they're not paying attention. They're just like, oh, it's a buzzword. It's gender neutral. No, it's a lot more than that. It's it's not just you know boyfriend jeans that say girl on them. You know okay. that's not it. Okay, um, I'm not gonna go into the details of what's the definition of gender neutral because our show is all about marketing and growing yes. and how you're growing your business. But I will tell you, keep this in mind. What would you do if someone were to offer you a offer to buy you out next year? You don't have to answer. I just wanted to put that scene in. <laughs> Yes. Remember, that's what happened with uh, Jet.com, right? Walmart tried to do their own e-commerce four times and they failed. Mm-hmm. And then eventually when they saw Jet.com, they're like, you know what, we're buying it. Even though it's a startup, they have, don't have a revenue, but we're buying it because they have the solution to our problem. But I have my answer for you, though, because I have thought about this. <laughs> um, for me, it's more, it's not about the number. It's about who I would be handing the keys to. If all they want to do is take advantage of the market and not really listen, then no. I would really have to know who I'm handing the keys to. There you go. Cool. I'm glad you know that. Look, so that's hey, the, everything. So what coming to the outlet today, 2022, what are your biggest challenges, pain points besides supply chain? Because everyone talks about supply yeah, chain. Yeah, supply chain. That's a big one. That's, all, that's Other than that. <laughs> Other than that, well, the cost of marketing has gone through the roof. Um, and the competition, because the bigger players are in the market now with the same keywords than us, uh, obviously it's gotten more expensive, but it's also so much harder to find our, you know, for our market to find us because of that. So it's been... Our, mar- it's, our marketing has been a really big pain point this year more than ever. And it's been tough. It's been really tough. Okay. Uh, if it's okay, let's dig a little bit deeper because this is something obviously I love talking about marketing. So how are people finding out? I know you have a strong Instagram presence, social presence. And in the initial days, how did people find out? How are you growing it now? Customer acquisition, things like that. Well, I have to tell you, for the first five years, Outplay is eight years old. For the first five years, Outplay, we didn't put a dime into marketing. It was all word of mouth and our social media. And we didn't pay for our social. It was all organic. So it, it, word of mouth for us is extremely important, extremely important, because that's how we've grown, really. And the last three years is when we've really put money into uh, marketing we started putting money into marketing around October of 2019, right before the pandemic. And uh, the the way we spend our marketing dollars is very important. We have to really budget because we are self-funded. So, you know, we don't have gobs of money lying around in case we, you know, just slap on, you know, try something. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. No, we got to really think things through. So we've been really concentrating on, uh, or our Google ads, our SEO, uh, and really ads through all our, all our social channels as well. And now we've just added TikTok as well. So 
ads on TikTok as well. Not only our account, but ads as well. And that is mainly, and then, well, now we've started adding new things like uh, our loyalty program on our website where, you know, the more you buy, the more points you get, the more you get rewarded for that. We've added certain things like that um, that have also helped us spread the word and incentivize people to come back and purchase some more. Okay, cool. Great. I mean, you touched on a few things that are very near and dear to me, Google ads uh, and SEO. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, TikTok is an area I am enjoying. I'm not a big fan of, you know, Facebook and Instagram ads just because, you know, that's kind of a black hole uh, these days. Yeah. <laughs> talking about Google ads and SEO, uh, how, what do you think of those two? I mean, overall, are you, what made you get started? What were your initial reactions? Would you tell someone, hey, you should look into it or not? Things like that. I think our business would not survive if we didn't, didn't have Google ads That's, because it's yeah, definitely, I mean, it's, it's not cheap. Yeah, it's not cheap and it's not easy. But if without Google Ads, we wouldn't we wouldn't survive. That's definitely a given. Are you real, or are you just saying it? Oh no, I'm I'm serious because uh, we before we started using Google Ads, I mean we were growing because we had great um, organic growth. But we really started to grow when we added Google Ads. I mean the months the sales months of high sales that we have is because of Google Ads. So we, in fact, we haven't, we haven't put mon money into Facebook and Instagram, I think this entire year so far, it's just been SEO, Google ads, and some TikTok and, uh, ads. And that's what we're doing right now. Wow. We've ever, you know, every so often we're thinking we have to put some money into Facebook and Instagram because then now they're punishing us and they won't show our account to anybody because we don't spend money on there. But, um, you know, a good portion, you know, maybe I, I think about a third of our sales come from Google ads. And if not, our SEO on Google gets us pretty high ranked. So with that, we wouldn't, our organic growth would be the same. But I mean, SEO and Google ads are separate, but they kind of play hand in hand, okay. you know, because it, it, if somebody sees you, sees your ad, and then they see you right there organically on the, right below, that means something. Yeah. And thank goodness people sometimes, smart, you know, click on the one without the ad. <laughs> so thank you for those who do that. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, I'm glad, you know, you. I didn't know that you feel that strongly about Google ads and SEO. I mean, I'm really like yes. taking it back. Um, so let's go back. And you had worked with an agency. I know we had that... Uh, small short discussion i think a couple of months back you want to share that how important it is to have the right agency right partner oh wow yeah um to, first of all i think it's important that you know what you're doing before you hand it over to somebody else okay because i don't think you need to be I, well we're not we're no experts at all but we know enough that when we hand our things to somebody else we know if they're doing something right or if they're doing something wrong we might have to ask a few more questions because we don't understand something in particular, but we can recognize things right away. And we hired uh, an agency to take over our Google ads uh, in January of this year. Uh, well, I have to do, I do have to say, we uh, moved our website. We did, we made several mistakes, one on top of the other. We went from WooCommerce to Shopify in October of last year. That was a big change. We figured that was our low season of the year. So it was safe for us to do that back then. Problem is that we didn't know what we didn't know. We didn't know we would lose all our SEO. Big problem. We had no clue. And then on top of that, we also not only migrated to Shopify, but we also changed our domain. So we had two things that we changed drastically. I mean, our old domain still redirect, but our main domain, that was new. So our new domain is shopoutplay.com, and that was new. So we didn't know what we, do, what we didn't know. And then we hired this agency in come January. And we were at the point, at that moment, when we handed the keys over, let's say, we were our sales were 115% above the year before. So we were moving towards doubling last year's sales. 
when they took over our account and took over our Google ads, within three weeks, we were negative 85% below last year. They stopped our best performing ads and decided to create a new funnel that had nothing to do with our product and made us spend thousands of dollars on an ad that had nothing to do with our product because they wanted to discard certain words. We're like, we could have told you that men's pants for office work would not be our target. That was one of the keywords they were testing out. Um, so hopefully, I mean, gladly, because fortunately is the word I'm trying to find for. Fortunately, my husband is so detail oriented and is constantly checking that he caught these things and started like blocking things for them. And then, and he would block them first and lock them and then tell him, tell them what they, you know, Hey, what are you doing? I need an explanation, but he'd have to lock things down because we were bleeding money by the second. So it wasn't, I'm going to wait for an explanation and then lock it down. It's like, no, I'm locking this down now. Now I need an explanation. Uh, it, it, we, I was trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. They probably know what they're doing. Maybe we're the ones who don't know what we're doing. But within less than two months in, we were like, I'm sorry, this isn't working. <laughs> we're, if we keep it at this rate, we're not going to survive next month. Our business will have died. So we went our separate ways. And that's when we discovered First of all, we discovered nobody, you know, they didn't even bother telling us. They just kept telling us, you're not even ranking. Like, well, why aren't we ranking? Can you tell us why? They had no clue. So luckily we went in and discovered we had lost all our SEO. We didn't know. And uh, they had paused all our ads, our best running ads and, and uh, changed. They didn't even bother to look into uh, negative keywords or add new keywords into our ads. They weren't grouping them correctly. It was just a disaster. So we went in and luckily, I mean, we're still a ways of where we should be, but we're not dying. We're moving forward. So we've, add, we've, uh, we've corrected our Google ads. We've added new ads. We're constantly adding new keywords, making sure that our negative keywords are where they should be and which ones they should be. Uh, and our SEO, which should take, six months for us to see something within two to three weeks, we were seeing serious traction with our SEO. I went in and did some serious SEO work on our website, broke it down to every single product, every single page, every single collection page, and made sure that uh, we were also, we also use SEMrush to help us with all our keywords figure. And we see what other brands that are similar to us, what they're doing, what words they're using, et cetera. And we've really managed to um, recuperate what we were losing. Yeah, I'm glad. And, see, and that was all Google Ads and SEO. Wow. If you had to make a pick, Google Ads versus SEO, who would you go with? SEO. Why? Um. I mean, they keep changing the algorithm on you, right? It's yeah, not like it is, it's true. It's not you have to constantly, either way, Google Ads or SEO, you still have to constantly be learning all the time and changing things and adding things. I guess for me, it's SEO is more fun because I don't understand Google Ads. Like I can write the copy for the Google Ads and I can tell you, oh, this word matches with this and this should go here. But the intricacy, I mean, so intricate in the whole, I just, ah, oh, so it's too left brain for me. I'm too right brain for that. <laughs> It's like, it's like too engineering for me. Uh, but SEO is very, for me, is you give me the, the keywords and I can bring them to life on our website. Okay. That'll attract people. So for me, I guess SEO is more fun. And that's why I would prefer SEO. Good. Because I can write all that copy because I write all the copy. So, and I, you know, and through these words, I also get to know my customer even better because I get to see what words they use to find us. What, you know, why do they use these words? Why do they use that word? You know, and I, I understand our customer even more through those words and the use of the words and how to use the words, you know, and it's fun. Very nice. Now, having, since you've gone through that, you know, I guess lesson, life lesson of who not to pick as an <laughs> agency, what advice or what 
what would you share with people who are probably thinking of getting an agency and they don't probably don't want to do it by themselves? What should they look for when they're interviewing agencies? What, what should they avoid? Who should they avoid? Biggest, biggest lesson, make sure that the agency has experience in your area of business. For example, the agency we made the mistake with, they're a service-based business agency. They work with all the other businesses they work with are service-based businesses, not e-commerce. Uh, if they do work with e-commerce businesses, we never heard about it. And that was the biggest mistake, and I didn't realize it before we hired them. I asked to speak to other clients of theirs. Uh, I, you know, we... We got to know them beforehand. We asked them several questions. And for some unknown reason, we never asked them if they had worked with e-commerce businesses before. And that was a big, big mistake. I mean, it's something that should have been first thing we should have asked. And we, for some unknown reason, we didn't. And they don't know. They didn't know how to really set our account up properly for what we do. Got you. That was a big mistake. And I think that you should always at least, you know, talk to as many agencies as possible and let, narrow it down to at least three. We're the last three. You know, you've heard this more than once, not from me. <laughs> the last three, you should be happy with either of the three and then just pick the best of the three. But if that one doesn't work out, you'd still be happy with any of the other two. And we didn't do that. Yeah, sounds like some wise guy we both know taught us that. Some wise guy taught us that. <laughs> Alex, right? Yeah, Alex Sharfin. Yes, uh, Alex. I mean, you know, he definitely, I learned uh, quite a few things from him. Okay, coming back. Let's not digress. I think that, I think that rule should be used for everything, by the way. Uh, yeah, I don't yeah. know how it will work in personal life, but let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm having fun with you. It's like, you know. <laughs> I just went through a whole bunch of scenarios in my head. <laughs> Let's not tell our respective spouses about that. <laughs> okay, right. cool. Um, so paid ads, uh, you, are, you took, you are in charge of it. You're running it. SEO you love. Uh, what else? Uh, are you doing any email marketing, any retargeting, anything like that? Uh, we are, we're, we're doing email marketing and SMS. SMS is new to us. We've been doing SMS for about maybe three months and SMS is killing it, by the way. It is amazing. The ROI on SMS is amazing because people really aren't, they're not checking their emails as much. I mean, I'm not the kind that, to say email's dead because it is not. <laughs> email is still great, but SMS is unbelievable. The return on SMS is, is crazy. And you can actually have conversations with your customers. You get to really understand who your customer is, ask them questions, really have a back and forth. It's a, a lot more direct and more um, instant. It's really, really great marketing, a really great marketing tool. You know, it's like what email used to be 20 years ago, I guess. Yeah. Where it was... But it's so much more personal because even through email, you can respond to somebody's email, but you don't get that back and forth unless I'm like, unless somebody's really sitting behind the computer and responding to that. But SMS, I mean, you can be anywhere and you're checking, you've got your phone with you all the time. Do you know anybody who doesn't have their phone with them all the time? So you get a text and you can respond to that immediately. You get like an immediate response or immediate reaction to, you know, to purchase something, to share something or to interact with the, your customer. It's crazy how immediate and, and amazing it, it is. It really is. You mean SMS, SMS, not WhatsApp messaging and things like that. Yeah, no, SMS directly to text messaging, not WhatsApp. And who are you using for your platform? Uh, right now we are using... Um, Oh, shoot. We were using Yotpo at the beginning, and then um, Attentive. We're using Attentive. It took me a second there, Attentive. Okay, cool. So Maria Alexander is endorsing SMS marketing. Folks, yes. it. go ahead, get on it. Yes, um, yes. I used to think it was, like, so creepy. Yeah, I um, thought so. I thought it was very creepy, but I then, you know, because I'm not the typical consumer because I, I sign up for things on purpose to test them out. 
I started to sign up to everything that everybody offered me for SMS. I was like, I'm going to test this out. So any brand that offered me SMS, I would sign up for. So I have, I'm signed up to the weirdest things. Like I get text messages from Tim McGraw. I'm a fan, but you know, it's very weird. A musician sending you texts like this uh, from that to like the dog, the store where we buy our dog food has SMS. And I signed up for that to every single brand I could find from swimwear, activewear, Tory Birch. I mean, the stuff that I'm signed up for is insane. So I, so I get to study how people do it, how other companies do it. And I started to see it really wasn't that creepy. It was actually really nice. So I didn't have to check my emails for anything in particular. I, or, you know, I get like, there's a brand that I follow uh, very close to the, I, well, I follow brands because of their marketing mainly, but I really like their products. Uh, I have, there's, see, there's two brands that I really like for um, uh, facial creams. And there's a difference. Like one of my favorite brand is called Carrie Grand, and I love that brand. But they don't use SMS, and I find it odd. But then I have a brand that's called uh, that I follow. It's called uh, Youth to the People. They use SMS like rock stars. It's crazy, unbelievable. I wish Carrie Grand used text messages. I use. I wish they did use SMS. I really do. And because the difference in my reaction to what they're doing, what you know, what they're offering, the education of their actual product through SMS keeps me so engaged. And Carrie Grand, which is the brand I use the most of anyway, I don't get to see them as often or I don't interact with them as often. So I tend to see how I compare brands that I use as well, not just brands that I rent, sign, sign up to, and see how they use their marketing differently. And I really wish that people like Carrie Grant used SMS because it isn't creepy. It's actually more personal. So I wish they did it. Very nice. Uh, now, you know, probably they still haven't caught up to that whole SMS marketing and they'll probably do it next Well, year. you know, their market is women over 40. So it is kind of weird for them to text a 40-year-old or 50-year-old woman. I guess they're still thinking about that because, but I... I mean, you know, 50 is the new 20. So I don't know, understand why they're not doing it. I will not go there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, let's, we're towards the end of the you know, show. So very quickly, where do you see the, what's the future for Outplay? I mean, I did kind of predict Sarah Blakely. I have my, <laughs> I'm still kicking myself for not taking on that opportunity I think a year or two years ago when you were thinking of bringing in outside investors, like that's another yeah. lifetime, right? Uh, but let's hear it from uh, you. What your future predictions are and things like that. What are you planning to do? Oh, um, I have so many, so many plans for this brand. So many plans for this brand. Uh, I want us to really make a difference in people's lives. I want us to be big enough to be able to help people as many people as we can to feel comfortable with who they are and be able to show that with confidence to the outside world. So I have a lot of plans. I hope we can grow this brand really to a really great level, really big level where we can affect that many people. Uh, and uh, I know I keep growing my team and keep growing this family that we're building here and changing people's lives. Very nice. Now, how can people find you? Uh, do you want to share your URL or? Uh, well, our website is shopoutplay.com and on social media, we're on every single channel. We are Outplay brand. Uh, that's just because outplay.com is taken by a computer animation company or they do video games. Sorry. So we couldn't find it. So ours, uh, on all our social media channels, we are Outplay brand. Okay, cool. And, uh, well, if anybody wants, I mean, I'm not that entertaining, but if, anybody wants to find me, my social media, uh, my Instagram is uh, Maria Alexandra Official. Maria Alexandra Official, without the Garcia then. It's yeah, without the Garcia. Oh, actually, yeah, Maria Alexandra is all one word, underscore official. I think that's my Instagram. Okay, you think? Oh my God, you're going to get me into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> think, I'm not quite sure. No, we will, I will make sure, you know, my team finds the right Maria Alexandra and <laughs> tags the right person. So that okay. way- we are not getting into trouble, but cool. Thank you so much, Maria Alexandria, for your time. I know you're very busy. Uh, thank you for taking the time uh, to come and share a little bit about what you're doing, your journey, how you are growing this business in these challenging times. 
uh, I know it's not easy to be in the supply chain market space at this time because things no. are getting completely turned on, turned off, things it's, are delayed. It's been it's been a three year hassle. It's been it's like never ending. You, we figure you know COVID's o- over, COVID's over, pandemic is over. I guess we everything will be back to normal. No, we're still waiting for pro- production. I should take forty five days. Is taking almost five months. So it's it's been. It's been interesting, full of lessons. It's folks, it's not easy to grow your business in this you know, challenging times. I'm, I'm going to keep saying, I keep using the word challenging because it is challenging. However, the strongest will survive. Uh, and Maria, Maria Alexandra is one of those you know, strong entrepreneurs out there. If you have any questions or you want, need mentorship, please reach out to her. I'm signing her up and I'm sure she will take good care of you with that. Thank you. Thank 